Hello and uh, good afternoon, I guess. Um, so we want to talk about is maybe an option and how to model nothing. And well, how this talk started is by Roman Sachse actually wanting to talk about it, but Roman Sachse got COVID and so now I'm doing it. And as you can see, I got long hair during the pandemic, um, but no COVID so far, which is cool. Um, yeah, Roman and I were colleagues for many years in the same company, worked on a healthcare system. We'll not talk about healthcare systems today, but about modeling nothing, which was an ongoing problem in our day-to-day -day work in any domain. So what you can expect from this talk. We will talk about null and the problem null brings, the usage of null brings to your model. We will talk about um, how to be very explicit with options, problems with options and how sometimes uh, in your domain modeling and how some types could help you with solving the problems that the option type introduces. And in the end, you'll learn how to um, build better data models and be more explicit and more semantic in your domain model in general, not only when modeling nothing, but also when modeling anything else. So what I do, and by I, I mean Roman, of course, because I'm giving Roman's talk here in the last minute, but what we do is we prefer explicitness over implicitness in any, in any case when we model in ubiquitous language or in any form of semantics. And that is kind of the point of the talk that we will get back to at almost every slide. So I have to take a look at my slides for a second. Oh, yeah, right. So the domain we're going to use today is scuba diving. You can book scuba diving classes at one of the big scuba diving schools. And from this domain, we picked some examples. So as a very first step, null and its uses in the scuba diving domain. So looking at this code, we have a wetsuit. Wetsuit is a simple enumeration, right? We just picked some C-sharp here, but it should translate easily to any other programming language. And you have some different values in there. You have small, medium, large, represented by S, M, and L. Last week, I've actually had a model with Vinted, a um, company from Vilnius, and realized that S, M, and L is a very German or European thing. There are other countries that have different sizes, and this is more complex than you think, but this is not about all the domains in the world, right? So in our domain, we have S, M, and L, and we have a class, a trainer, and a trainer has um, an ID, of course, a name, an age, and also a preferred wetsuit size. Now, this is our class that we're going to be working with. Now, the problem is when we have a trainer repository, the trainers that we could load up, we can find a trainer by name, right? Go in, taking a database call. And then once you have the trainer, you have to check, well, did I find trainers? And if yes, let's go through the trainers and then um, instantiate all the fields. So up here, what could happen is that the repository itself um, has no entries for this name. So all of a sudden, we don't have a trainer. There are no rows, so we are returning a null. Trainer not found means return a null, of course, right? Because what else would you return? There is no default trainer. But we also have late initialization. So the trainer gets initialized, and then you return a trainer. But if something, if the reader read has no fields in it, right, you'll return a null object. So uninitialized values, or you return a trainer with uninitialized values for age and so on, that is a problem as well. Other problems that occur are optional values. Well, we find the trainer. And the trainer has a name, but the trainer doesn't have the age entered. So there is no entry in the database. And because there is no entry in the database, we still have to interpret in any shape or form. So we put it in a null, right? So who's using nulls on a day-to-day -day basis to resemble any of these um, fields? I can't see many. Oh, yeah, there's many hands here. Wow, the lights are blinding. OK, cool. So yeah, this is um, you're, you're all making a big mistake. And I'm going to show you how to be better at your day-to-day -day job. But null has a big problem, right? Um, but this is not all. There are more cases. When you do error handling, something goes wrong. You don't know what. There is any kind of exception. And what do you do in a case of an exception? Well, you can throw the exception, of course. Then you have a stack trace and whatnot. But in case of the trainer, you still return null. And then there is the. The next case, the one of partial applying, right? There's a partial function. Every value of a string that you could enter in parsing the size, if it is an S, an M, or an L, you can return the enum field or an object. But if it's anything else, any other character or string, you will return null, of course. So that means partially you'll get what you want, and in many other cases you won't. And this is a lot of responsibility for a simple value as null. There has been a talk at Build Stuff a few years ago uh, with the name uh, The Billion Dollar Mistake, or was it even DDD Europe? Don't remember. But if you Google the talk, The Billion Dollar Mistake, the invention of null is one of the most costly problems in software development. 
So Null is doing all of these things, and this is kind of like, oh, why so much responsibility for something that doesn't even have a value? Now, what we're doing here is we're dealing with uncertainty. And none of those states are explicit. You never know why you have this. Something is null. Why? Was it an error? Was there no entry? Was it not defined? Is it optional in the domain? We don't know that, right? So that's kind of the point of this talk. And we want to show how to deal with uncertainty. You're looking at source code, right? We want to view a trainer. We're using the trainer repository. Hey, find trainer by name. And of course, then we can show the trainer in some form of very fancy UI here, as you can tell. And the first thing we need to do is check, check for null, right? The trainer could be null. We know that now. We've seen the repository work. So we need to check if trainer is not null. And then we need to check if the age is not null, because that's an optional value. And we need to check if the I can't see that wetsuit size is not null because, well, for any kind of mistake, it could not be set, right? Uh, so all of these different reasons are reasons why things can be null. But why don't we check the name or trainer ID for null? Well, because we know that this, ca this, this cannot happen. But you need to know how the repository works to make that distinction. And that's kind of not the purpose of encapsulation, right? If you need to know every line of code to know what you need to check, then you really don't need to check anymore because you already know. Anyway, so that's kind of the uncertainty we're trying to get rid of. So that's null and its problems, right? It's, um, it's a member of any type. Well, depends on your programming language, of course, but in most programming languages like C Sharp, Java, the most famous ones, null can be in any type. So you have to check everything for null. If any value can be null, you must check everything. And this is never explicit, which is kind of the point of the talk again, being very explicit about things. And if everything can always be null and must always be checked, we're probably not going to check it because we developers are a lazy bunch of <coughs> people. So is there help? Well, maybe there is help. This is a nice pun because there is a type in many functional programming languages called maybe or optional or option. Um, and if you're very fancy, you know it's a monad, but let's not get into that now. Um, the option type is a type that is either some value or it's no value, very explicit. And you can read this as an XOR, right? Saying option is a type which is either some value, generic in this case, or none value, and then you don't need a content. And if you're not using something fancy like F Sharp, which is this beautiful language, uh, you can do this in object-oriented programming with an abstract superclass and some hierarchy. But instead of three lines of code, you have to write three pages of code, but it still works. Um, it's an initial effort that you need to put in to build this type, but once you have it or find it on GitHub by someone else, you can use it even in an object-oriented way. So using the option type makes things be more explicit. Let's go through some of the examples making partiality explicit, right? We had the function where you can enter anything, and depending on the value, it returns something or it returns null. Well, if we make it an optional return type, so we have the function here called parse wetsuit size, and the parameter is a size, right? You enter any, any string of your choosing, and the return type is not just a size or just a, an enum. It's now an option of wetsuit size. So option is a generic type that is encapsulating another value. An option can only be, as you can see in the corner, some or none. Meaning, in the case of if we match it with an S, right, we return some wetsuit size S. If we match it with an M, we return some match M and so on and so forth. In any other case, which is what the underscore is for, in F sharp at least, so in all the other cases, we return none. Meaning, whoever calls this function cannot ignore that. You don't get a wetsuit size back, you get an option of wetsuit size. And if you want to know the content, you need to unpack the option. You need to get the content from it. So it's an explicit return type. This explicitity makes it so that you don't have to think about, is it maybe nullable or not? No, it's obvious because it's an optional type, right? Any other type that's not optional, you don't have to worry anymore. Well, to dwell on this for one more second, if you're using C Sharp or Kotlin or so, you have nullable types, right? You can make the question mark behind the type, and then you have explicit nullability, which is cool. It's a bit better than not doing that, but it still doesn't tell you why it's not a value. It still is one of the five reasons, why. Right? So optionality makes it explicit. Now, making this explicit means instead of returning null, we return always something and um, 
and being explicit by it. That, that's the whole point. The point is moving over. So being explicit instead of implicit makes your code less error prone and people don't have to think so much to make the right choice. Now the same thing, of course, once we have partiality solved, uh, becomes simple to go with what, if, what happens if a value is not found. So we go through the repository here and if the trainer has rows, then we return a certain trainer, right? Same thing we can do with optional types, but in this case, if there are no rows, instead of returning a trainer, in case there are rows, instead of returning just an object, we return some object, which is one of the cases of the optional type. So we say, hey, here is a trainer. It's packed in a box, but it's a trainer. In the case if there is no entry, we'll return none, making it explicit. So you're getting the gist by now, I guess. So meaning um, from the implicit to the explicit, which is again the point, right? Now let's talk about errors, because errors are a little bit different. If we have something that we want to do, right? We ask a database, we get some data back, we do some computation, and then something breaks and we hit an exception. What would we do in the case that we get an exception? Well, in the old case, we return null and through some exception. Now we return none, cool but we also return none when no trainer is found. So if I call this function and it gives me a none back, what happened? Did I get an error or were there no trainers with that name in the database? We don't know and that sucks. So let's be more explicit. Option means there is a value or not, but we can be more explicit by using the result type, saying, hey, if a result is okay, then there is a value in it of some type, right? And if it's not okay, then we have an error of some error type. So making an explicit class with two generics, any kind of error, any kind of result, you can specify what kind of result can come from this. So in our case, we know what we want is a result of optional trainer, which is just a type, right? So it's a trainer or not a trainer that we can return as an okay result. And in case of it's not an okay result, well, our error type is a string. We just hit an error message back to the, to the caller. That's all. So making it explicit that you have a different case here. There is an error or not an error. That's not just optional, right? Because from a domain perspective, it's not an option. It's a technical thing that goes wrong. That's a different level. Now, that's all great. And oh yeah, I missed the blue arrows again. So we talked about that. And that is exactly the point. So with all that said, option is a really good type. Option and return types as well. And it helps you to make explicit when can't read from that screen. When we deal with values that might not be there, it's really easy to make certain types of functions total, meaning for every parameter you enter, you will get definitely a deterministic outcome. Well, not deterministic, but you will definitely get a type safe outcome. So there are no undefined states anymore. And it does not compile if you don't deal with it. You can't just not deal with the option. You need to deal with it because it's a return type. You cannot get to the value without actually explicitly going both ways and say, what do we do in the case of there is something or there's nothing? Well, again, in functional programming or in f -sharp specifically, this is super easy because the compiler actually forces you to handle all cases. In c -sharp, you could theoretically not handle the non-case and then have an exception when it happens, but that would be lazy programming and we never do that, right? So <laughs> option carries no specific semantics. That's our problem with option. I promised you option is a good solution to the null problem, but now that we have option, it bears its own problem because it's not semantic. It just tells us there is something or there is nothing. But if we have something like a registration for a course, I want a course, I want to register for a scuba diving course. And when that works, I'll get the, the scuba diving course number back, right? That's the number I get, so we have an option of int. If it doesn't work, I'll get a none, cool. Now, technical errors aside, that would be a different return type again, but what could be the reasons for it not working? Well, it could be the course is full, right? Or registration didn't start yet, or I'm too young for this course, or I don't specify because of the requirements that are needed to take part in this course. So there are many reasons why the domain could say no to this. We don't know what none means in this case. We just return a none and saying, hey, you don't get this course. Nice. Now, we want Explicit, this word is hard for me. We want to have things explicit. Um, implicit semantics are bad. Domain errors or the non-happy path of your domain have to be made explicit because they are not technical problems, they are actual parts of your business. 
I would even argue and say that those are the more valuable parts of your business because the happy path, anybody can code, right? If you want to reserve a seat, seat has been reserved, cool. That's kind of obvious. But what are all those cases that could go wrong? That's where the actual interesting cases lie. So let's talk about our domain model. I'll give you a very simple domain model, scuba diving. <laughs> We're not going to go into depth of this whole model, right? Because it's a 25 minute talk and not a one day workshop. Um, but yeah, look at the middle on the top, right? There are different levels of scuba divers. You have an adventure diver, you have an advanced open water diver and so on. And those are different levels you can dive in. But for all of these levels, there are different specialities. And that's important. So let's remember that, right? We have the ice water diver or the, the deep water diver and the, so on and so forth. And those are all courses you can book, right? Given your level and a certain speciality, you can book courses with our EcoDive Paddy company. Now, if you want to register for the course, you have different fields to fill out. So we have a level, a speciality, and the course you want to book. And we already learned using optional things instead of making things implicitly, maybe null or not, right? That would be bad. So now we have optional things, cool. And we can actually instantiate a meaningful course registration saying, if you have some level adventure diver and your speciality is deep diver, right? And you didn't register a course yet, but now you could, that's cool. This is a valuable step in the workflow. But you could say, I don't have a level, but I have a speciality. And that makes no sense. This state can never exist in our domain. But what do we do? Because we're good programmers, we put in validation logic everywhere. We put in a lot of validation in the front end, so we know in the back end this case can never happen, and we don't have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, been there, done that multiple times, and I'm suffering still from it. Um, that's not what we want, right? Uh, you don't want to trust the system or trust people to be thorough, because that never worked in human history. So let's make it safe so that this can never happen. Um, so the implicit constraints should become you guessed it, explicit. So we need better types than options to model our domain. An option is not very specific, like why is the value not here? Domain errors are not explicit, and multiple options or booleans in combination can have semantical or business rules behind it that we need to take care of. Now, algebraic data types to the rescue. And I'm saying this now without explaining what algebraic data types are, but you can ask me later if you like, because we only take care of one simple algebraic data type, the sum type. And you've already met that one. This is a sum type. And again, why it's called sum type, not important now. If you are object oriented, you can use an abstract superclass and subclasses. If you use something like a functional programming language, um, these are the types you want to use. So this is an either or type. It's either optional, some value or none. And you have seen result, right? It's either okay of result type or an error. Let's build our own semantic sum types. Because why would we only use the ones that are built into the language? We are domain driven developers, right? Ubiquitous language is what we live for in our bounded context. So if you want to register for a course, instead of returning an optional of int, which tells you, hey, there is a value or not, right? Let's say, we build our own type called registration. And a registration can be one of either cases. It's an accepted registration with a confirmation number in it, or it's a course full without any other fields, or it's a waiting list spot, right? So these are the different cases you can get. It's either accepted, the course is full, or you're on a waiting list now. And those cases carry their own information with them. So you can imagine how much code this would be as an abstract class with subclasses, but still it's just typing and it would work. Now, these are the cases, these are the different values in there, and this is now the return type of the function we need. Instead of having an optional int, we just return a registration. Every possible value the domain can take, even the edge cases or the error cases that are business driven, they get returned in a single return type. So explicit semantics, domain errors explicit, that's what we want. Now, what we can do is we can use some types to make illegal states unrepresentable. You don't need unit tests. You don't need a good front end to protect your back end or whatever. If the type system doesn't allow an instantiation of illegal values, you're golden, right? So instead of having something where you can say level is none and speciality is this or that, let's say we have a workflow and the workflow has multiple values it can take. It has choose paddy level, right? Or it has choose speciality, and for that you need to have a paddy level already as a parameter. Or you have choose course, and that needs a level and a speciality. So with these types, if you want to instantiate them, 
you wouldn't be able to actually instantiate one of those with the wrong parameters. I can't say, hey, only a speciality in my registration. That doesn't work. If you are at step three, choosing course, you have two parameters, your level and your speciality. So defining your steps even as types makes your workflow be an explicit type system, and then your type system works for you. It protects you from yourself. Instead of implicit constraints, we now have explicit constraints, which again is kind of the point of the talk. So this leads us to the conclusion. Um, when you model or when you build any kind of meaningful complex system, first you model data and behavior without thinking about the code. Don't write code and say, oh yeah, but what is this null and then let that drive your modeling, right? Code, of course, is a kind of a feedback loop for models, but explicit upfront exploration is super important. It's not about big design upfront, but about big exploration upfront. You want to understand the domain. So that's, that's the thing to take away from. And once you have modeled your domain using event storming or any other method that you prefer, model the domain errors as first class citizens. If the ticket isn't reserved, if the warehouse was empty, if any other kind of mistake happens in the domain, those are actually business cases. Make them explicit as cases or types in your model. And always start with semantic types. Don't start with primitive data types just because it's easy. Spend the time to build a semantic type system to bring your language and your understanding into writing. If that feels awkward, then your domain model doesn't fit yet. From experience, whenever you're trying to express something in code, you realize, oh yeah, this, this, this sounds wrong. Well, maybe because it is. Let's talk about it in full sentences, right? Um, Eric Evans heuristic, model out loud. If what you say makes sense, if it sounds pleasing to the ear of the domain expert, it's probably a good model. And then explicit domain model makes illegal states unrepresentable, giving you maximum safety that your compiler will protect for you. <coughs> Given that you're using something like JavaScript, of course, <clears throat> that's a problem, right? It's a trade-off. I'm not saying JavaScript is a bad language. I'm saying JavaScript is a not optimal choice if you want to have strong type safety. Um, so you could use TypeScript, of course, or anything else that makes you uh, give you a type system. But choose the right language that allows you to build what you need, given the trade-offs you have. If your whole team is only using Java, well, forget about F-sharp, right? You're using Java. But then build whatever is necessary to make this a simple thing. And if you all do all these steps, then much win, big success. So that's it for now. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Given that this wasn't my talk, but the talk of Roman Saxe, who can't be here sadly today, um, go to his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the deaf owl. If you want to learn more about F sharp and modeling with F sharp, there's like, I don't know, a week of videos on there or so if you want to see more of this. And I'll see you in the hallway. Have a good day. <laughs>